Okay, good afternoon. I uh, want to encourage the punctuality, <laughs> so I want to start at 3.30. And also because I feel at the end there's a panic about the uh, parking of cars and things like that. And uh, I was warned today also <laughs> to be careful with this. So I will try to, to take uh, just the time uh, that I should. Okay, so we have seen uh, last time, uh, speaking of Kriegoff, that uh, I, I went fast on this at the end of the lecture, uh, on his interest on the Indian subject, uh, the iconography of the Amerindian, if you want. You have to realize that his approach is very peculiar. It's not at all, I would say, typical that uh, what we will find like today with, with Paul Kane. Uh, was born in 1810 and died in 1873, so it's really a man of the 19th century. And he is much more typical of the approach of this subject matter that will be his unique subject, of course, uh, than what Kriegoff uh, have, have sense. Uh, I suggested last time that because of his uh, German upbringing, he may have shared some of uh, the perception of the forest in particular as a place of refuge, as a place where a small nation like uh, the German were at the beginning of their history, if you want, could resist a huge nation like the Roman Empire at the time by retreating in the forest. But this is very peculiar to Germany and you don't find it in the rest of Europe. Habitually, the forest is perceived in the country like a desert in a way, like the place of savagery. And uh, civilization means also the destruction of the forest. You have to push uh, the, the line of trees to establish gardens, to establish, uh, let's say, field, a cultivated field. And habitually, uh, the forest is seen negatively. And of course, people who, who are linked to the forest, people who live in it, are also seen as savages, as uh, people from, from the wild, if you want. And this is certainly closer to Paul Kane's uh, perspective of which uh, I will speak today. Uh, if you want, just a few notes about how the career of Paul Kane started and how he got interested in the subject matter. It seems to be linked to a very peculiar uh, type of circumstances. He was in London in 1842-43, and his attention was attracted to an exhibition by an American painter is called George Catlin, uh, C-A-T-L-I-N. And Catlin was presented in the Egyptian Hall on Piccadilly Circle, if, uh, if you want, uh, really in the middle of London, since about already two years and a half, an exhibition of painting was habitually accompanied also with what you call tableau vivant. Uh, what it was, he was asking some actor to, to put costume of, uh, of uh, native people and to hack like, like savages on the stage, you know, to, to, to frighten a little bit the public and to, to, to make uh, shouting and things like that. And everybody, of course, liked to be frightened a little bit. So uh, it was a good business going, going like this. But after, of course, two or three years of that, people become less enthusiastic about this show. And suddenly, he had the chance to have a real group, uh, a, no, a group of real Indians coming to Liverpool. Uh, they were Ojibwe people, sent probably in delegation to London to uh, claim for their own people and to, to discuss with, with the representing of the, of the queen or the, or the king uh, about their own problem. But then he says, wow, this is fantastic. Now I could advertise that not only I will have tableau vivant, but tableau vivant with, with real Indians. Uh, like this is one of the painting that he did of this group of, of Ojibwe people uh, performing for him in the Egyptian art. And this is what uh, Kane saw. Uh, and uh, he was absolutely uh, enthusiastic about it. He met apparently Kathleen also on the spot. Uh, since uh, he, in uh, letters of his friend, he's me somebody mentioned your friend, Kathleen. You see, as if really they, they met at the time. And uh, not only that, Kathleen have published also a book about his own experience as a painter in the west of the United States and how difficult it was to paint all these people. was called Letters and Notes huh, about uh, the American Indian. Uh, it was just published, 1831. 
and uh, Cain bought it and, and read it with, with enthusiasm also. And he found there, described very precisely what was the intention of this Kathleen picture. And you will see that uh, it could even uh, describe also his own uh, purpose uh, in the, uh, by dealing with the subject matter. What Kathleen wrote, he says, what he wanted to do, it's a literal, I quote, literal and graphic delineation of living manners, custom, and character of an interesting race of people who are rapidly passing away from the face of the earth. You have three things there. Uh, an exact delineation, so the, there's an intention of realism, if you want, in this picture. He wants to be accurate. He wants to represent things as they are. You have a, a more dubious type of concept of race, uh, uh, an interesting race of people. Uh, this is very typical also of the 19th century. You don't have this concept in the 17th century, for instance. People don't think in that way. Uh, you are all human or you are uh, outside of humanity. You are a monster or something like that. You, you don't have, uh, they don't have this type of uh, distinction. But the 19th century with the, uh, with the biology and all that, we become to define racial characters. Uh, the, the, uh, anthropology become to me start to measure heads and things like that. This is very typical of the 19th century. And finally, the idea that this race is, is disappearing from the face of the herd, of course, um, uh, allude to another theme which is very important in the 19th century, is the theme of progress. Uh, these people are vanishing because they are replaced by more civilized people. Uh, when you see then uh, in Paul Kane books, because he did exactly like Kathleen, he published also uh, a book of his own where he tells his stories about how he's roaming in, in uh, west of Canada. And, and, uh, and uh, the book was called Wandering of an Artist Among the Indians of North America. So it's exactly uh, the subject matter that sure. He defined also his own intention, uh, what he wanted to do. And you will say it's not in the same words, but it's really the same concept that are applied here. I quote, the subject was one in which I felt a deep interest in my boyhood. I had been accustomed to see hundreds of Indians about my native village, then Little York, muddy and dirty, just struggling into existence. Now the city of Toronto, bursting forth in all its energy and commercial strength. But the face of the red man is now no longer seen. All traces of its footstep are fast being obliterated from his own favorite hounds. And those who will see the Aborigines in, of this country in their original state or seek to study their native manners and custom must travel far through the pathless forest to find them. Uh, it's basically the same idea. You have this idea that what he wanted to do also is to make the, an accurate uh, portray, portrayal of these people. Uh, he make an allusion to the theme of progress by opposing Little York to bursting Toronto, of course. And then you have the idea of race when you um, describe the Indian as the red people, See the uh, les peaux rouges in French. You, you will have exactly the same idea when you de de describe the others by the color of his skin. Uh, so you are more or less the same intention in both people. And indeed, you could say that uh, uh, Cain wanted to be the, the Canadian Kathleen. Uh, he wanted to do what Kathleen had done for the United States to do it for Canada also. There is also behind this idea of progress, this idea that history uh, is uh, have also moral implication. Uh, what uh, the, his depiction want to do is to show more or less how good it is to have progress from the state of these people. Uh, it, it is always uh, understood like this. And, and Kano, this is, is relatively clear. He says, I trust that my painting uh, will possess not only an interest for the curious, but also an intrinsic value to the historian. Uh, why? Because the, the, he, he pretend that what we are representing in this painting in the state of humanity before civilization. Uh, it is at the time that people like Lewis Morgan become to describe the evolution of man like in three stages. Uh, first, we, we had sav savagery. Uh, we were all wild. And uh, habitually, it's defined by these people at that stage were making a living through hunting and fishing only. Uh, and also even uh, gathering some wild fruits and things like that. But this is the first stage. And then barbary. 
Uh, the, the Barbary correspond to the creation of agriculture and the beginning of little villages. And then people get settled down a little bit, they have their field, they produce their food, so they, they were freer than the, the first stage. And finally, civilization with two things, with the creation of the city and the creation of writing also. And these are two signs of civilization. And of course, uh, when you present the thing in that perspective, it's always implied that to be civilized is much better than to be a savage. Uh, it's always, there are always this kind of uh, jugement de valeur uh, behind this, uh, the, the way, uh, the way it, it is perceived. Uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, then, when uh, Cain wants to represent the Indian in their original state, uh, he will tend to try to see them as savages, uh, as the first step of the evolution of man, uh, as if the more authentic Indian will be the one, the one closer to this first stage. And, and this uh, is very typical of the way they will construct the image of the Indian because they will be confronted to some groups uh, that are much more advanced than this uh, so-called first stage or, or original state. For instance, the Iroquois people were practicing a kind of horticulture. They were cultivating um, pumpkin, uh, tobacco, uh, corn, of course, and uh, beans and things like that, all things that were absolutely unknown in Europe at the time huh? and were become very important uh, uh, in our diet of today, if you want. Huh? Uh, but this, when you look at a painting of, of, these, uh, of what these people like Cain did of these Indians, this is never represented. They will be represented as hunter and uh, eventually less fishermen, but certainly not like agriculturists. The, it will go also, uh, some of these tribes are relatively stable village with a palisade around and with houses who were relatively permanent, let's say. Others were more nomadic, were more moving. The tendency in the image will be to represent the nomadic people and not the village. Uh, you will have teepees, uh, you will have a, a tent like this who are kind of easy to move type of houses, but you will not have the villages. Uh, uh, also, we will try not to represent too much the result of the contact with the whites. Uh, for instance, guns. Uh, it would be nicer to represent Indian with arrow <laughs> and bow, bow and arrows, uh, instead of with guns. Uh, uh, or with uh, 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 canvas, not with canvas uh, tent, if you want, but with tent with a kind of bark of, uh, of birch tree and things like that, that will look more genuine and more closer to the original state. So that means when these artists like Cain and, and others like Kathleen wants to represent what they call the real Indian, the one who is not touched by civilization, they would tend to eliminate certain aspects of their culture and to retain only the one who correspond to the idea that they have of this first stage. Uh, you understand that there's a selection there. There's a kind of construction of the image that will be done there. And the paradox of this building of the image at a time, it is you are at a period where the Indian people is asked or is pressed to be assimilated to us. Uh, and what happened, is, it's uh, in a way, a process like this. There's a lot of things we ask them to abandon. Uh, we, I mean the European or the Canadian at the time, or whatever uh, people were in power and wanted them to assimilate to us. Uh. So for instance, nomadism should be abandoned. Uh. You, should, you should settle, you should, uh, we will give you reservation, we will give you land, and you will stay there. You will not move like, like you did. This is barbaric, this is not nice. Uh. Then, uh, a feast, you know, where people eat too much. Mm -mm, this is not good. You will get fat and all. This is not our value. Uh, uh, of course, uh, more free sexual mores. Oh, oh, this was also forbidden. Uh, so there was a lot of things that they were asked to abandon. Uh, I, I think also of uh, uh, healing ritual uh, with masks and things like that. This is not a way to, to heal somebody. You know, you should take our drugs and things like that drugs that uh, at the time could kill people, but anyway. And the, and the, uh, so, so we will, the, the process of assimilation asked them to abandon a lot of, of things. 
But these things that we ask them to abandon is precisely what the image maker keep as a, a way to represent them, as if the image is built on the remnant of acculturation. Uh, and you have this paradox that these images, in fact, represent the Indian as they were never. Uh, they were never like that. They were more complex than the image that we give of them. And as we ask them not to be also. Uh, so you have a kind of, uh, it may look real for us to, to, to see that after because we were so brainwashed by this type of image, but we have to realize that these images are completely constructed in that way. Uh, they are recuperating what the assimilation process asks them to abandon, and they are representing them in a way that they were never uh, as such. Uh, they were never as such, uh, and that's the way they were represented. Okay, this introduction being done, Let's see uh, paintings by Kane and let's see how much, how it is constructed and how it is. This one is called An Indian Encampment on Lake Huron. Okay. We have to understand that Kane have made basically two trips of, uh, to take notes and to, uh, to document himself, if you want, in Canada. Uh, the first one will bring him from Toronto to the Great, Lake re uh, Great Lakes region. Uh, uh, imagine a trip or starting from Toronto, then uh, uh, Lake Simcoe, uh, and then the Severn River, and ending up in Lake Huron, in the north of the Lake Huron, where you have many Tulin Island of, in that region. Uh, th this is the first trip, more or less, will bring him in that region. A little bit then, uh, further, uh, the further he will go, the first trip is uh, so St. Marie. Uh, uh, and during the, that, uh, that time, okay, he will take, he will not make, of course, picture as elaborated as this one during the trip itself. This is done after in studio. Huh? But it's based on drawings, on notes taken on the spot, and some of them have been reconstructed. What we know about the painting of, of Kane is, is the following. There is, he wanted to make 100 of these paintings and to sell them en bloc, you see, all together to the uh, Canadian government. But uh, he never succeeded. The, the Canadian government uh, uh, ordered him 12 paintings instead of 100 and paid him 500 bucks to, to, to get rid of him. And, and he, he, he took a lot of time to do, to deliver the good in a way, up to a point that he was even sued in, in, in the court, you know, because he was not doing what he was supposed to do. And, uh, and so he was deceived with this project. Uh, finally, they will be acquired by the private collector and they will end up at the Royal Ontario Museum, at uh, this 100 picture. But there was also, a series, a little sketch that he did, and you are much, probably much closer to uh, the, uh, the experience of Kane on the ground, if you want, in the field. Huh? And these little, like this one, is an oil sketch done exactly in the same region that he wants to represent here, and maybe have uh, one of the source of inspiration of his painting. Uh, the, uh, you see uh, the first thing that struck uh, me when, when you put uh, the two together, it is in the sketch there's no people. Uh, uh, as if uh, to make an exact uh, depiction like this, people are moving and all that, it's no good. So you, 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 you just forget about them and you probably uh, tell yourself, well, when I will be back in the studio, I will remember how they were, and I will put uh, properly uh, see some scene like this of uh, this man lying on the ground, this woman working, and these people around. So I, will, I will complete the picture in a way. Huh? So you see already when you confront the sketch with the painting, you see that the painting is an elaboration, is a construction. It's not a kind of a snapshot scene of, of something seen in front of you. Huh? The, uh, another of these uh, sketches is much closer to the picture. If you see the canoe here and the, the tent behind, it seems to be almost a quotation of this. And of course, it's the reverse. It's this that is quoting that, of course. It's a kind of uh, crayon uh, uh, things that he did on the spot also. The personage that we have here, uh, the only way I could relate them, it, it is in this uh, uh, sketch pad of, of Kane. Kane have, brought with him a little pad, and he made uh, rapidly on it sketches of what he saw. And uh, of course, this is a little bit difficult to see, but you will see here, for instance, you have a man lying, and it's called Big Chief, and it's probably 
serve as a model of the one who is lying here. Uh, uh, you have also a group of people gathered around, like, a little bit like here, yeah, gathered around a um, uh, kettle where, where they prepare their food. And finally, I, not, I, almost, I, I don't know if you see it, I don't, uh, <laughs> from my angle here, but I hope you see it. The, there is also finally a, a woman uh, pounding maize in the, in the uh, kind of mortar. Uh, that was the way to, to make the flour that they needed to make uh, their bread. Uh, so there's and can and different little scene like this uh, taken on on the spot, and and this of course have been then integrated in this picture, uh, not exactly uh, to, with different angles or different as if it was a kind of ad memoir, you know, something to remember exactly what it is, and then he could he could put them in the picture. Doing this, then you have certain stereotype that could say. Maybe all this is based on observation, but when you compose the, uh, the picture, then certain stereotypes come out. One of the most common one and famous one, if you want, because you have it already in Champlain, Cartier, and uh, all the 17th, 18th century have repeat that, it is among the Indians, men do nothing and women do all the work. Yeah. And indeed, the big chief there is lying on the ground, looking at his wife, pounding the, the maize in a, in a mortar, the women here are working at the preparation of food. Men are, uh, in Indian society, are doing nothing. Okay? And this is repeated again and again, including by, by Cain himself in his wandering of an artist in his book. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, is uh, as among all other tribes of North American Indian, the women do all the household work, carrying wood, putting up the lodges, and cooking. Yeah? And uh, of course, men also doing nothing. Yeah? This is a kind of stereotype, it's a, it's, it comes from a kind of misunderstanding of the way the uh, division of labor was working. Uh, uh, I don't want to save the reputation of the men <laughs> at, at any cost, but apparently they were doing heavy work in, in different time, in different season, and the more common work was done by, by women. But anyway, whatever will be the, the basis of the error there, it is typical of this thing, and I think it have worked in the way that the picture finally is constructed. Uh, you suddenly have this stereotype that make you organize the scene uh, as you see it. Uh, other example, let's say uh, this picture, and I will show you in parallel the uh, sketchbook, uh, the sketch pad uh, uh, drawings that is uh, preparatory to it. Here, uh, Cain called it an Ojibwe camp uh, at Spider Island in Georgian Bay. So we are still in the same region. Spiders uh, Islands, in fact, there's many little islands. There, apparently there are 30,000 of them <laughs> there, so you, you have the Embarras du Choix. But Spider Island is, is one group of islands. And then again, in his wandering of, um, of an artist, he says, we put ashore on one of the Spider Islands to escape from a heavy shower, so it is Maybe a little bit represented here. See, you, you see in the background of the picture kind of a darker place uh, that could be the, the shower. And uh, where we found a single lodge, uh, this one, and a woman and her two children were there. Uh, you see the woman and, and well, one, chil one child is there. The other is on her back. And, uh, but the men were off in the distance fishing. Uh, you see them here. When you compare, of course, the drawing, you have no personage at all. And more interesting also, the tent is very different. Here is in canvas. It has been bought, of course, in Toronto, normally, like everybody. And here it is in bark, and it looks much more primitive and much more genuine. Huh? This is always this obsession with the original state. Huh? So if you want, we, uh, we tend uh, to, to hide the, um, the commerce or the exchange of the native people with the, with the white, uh, because this is, uh, doesn't look authentic enough. Huh? Then there will be a circumstance that will help uh, Kane to make some uh, portrait of Indian. What happened, he, ha he, he got in his traveling, uh, he's uh, going in canoe from one place to the other, and he went to uh, Manitoulin Highland, where the Canadian government was making big uh, gathering of people there because they wanted the Indian to settle on the island. 
and one of the trick, uh, say politicians are always full of imagination, as you know, one of the things they had it was to give them present to stay there. So Indian come, take the present, and go back where they wanted. So it, it never worked. In 1868, it fin finally <laughs> abandoned the system. It never worked. I guess to, to live in Manitoulin Island was not very attractive, but whatever the reason. Anyway, because there was this present giving, there was a lot of people there, and different tribes were represented there. And for Cain, this was a bonanza because he could then make the picture of this one and this one and this one without having to travel uh, all, all over the, the place. Uh, they were, in a way, concentrated there. And he got interested by this fellow is here uh, that, uh, well, he always give them a very complicated Indian name, like Shawana Sowe. It sounds more authentic, of course. Probably it's true, but uh, it, we, we have to remember that all these depict, uh, t t t these people, this image maker, don't speak the language of these people. Uh, and so they go through interpret all the time. They don't, I, and uh, when they tell you, well, he told me, and I did that, and I told him, apparently <laughs> this is all construction. Uh, uh, it's, it's a fact that the, the book of, of Cain is as constructed as his painting. Huh? See, it's not because it's written that this is genuine and what, what, he, uh, what he paint is more uh, imaginative. Huh? The book is, is built the same way. There were some studies of, some, uh, of manuscript of Cain, and the difference between the manuscript and the book are, are amazing. To, to begin with is orthograph. The orthograph of Cain is e incredibly fant uh, uh, fantasist, uh, the, almost like mine. The, 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 it he make all mistakes possible. He, he, he write like, uh, uh, like it sounds and all that. Very, very strange because at the time, okay, you did have that, uh, but his case is very special. And of course, when you read Wandering of an Artist, it's perfectly good English. It's well written. There's no, so somebody have, intervened there. Uh, uh, somebody went uh, on his back and, and corrected his mistakes. Huh? So it is, uh, both are constructed like that. So he, anyway, he called him that way, and he translated this for us. He says, one with his face toward the west. This man was supposed to be a shaman, meaning, uh, like he says, a, a sorcerer. Huh? And he was supposed to have a great reputation and then uh, you see the uh, devious type of uh, approach. He said, ah, oh, uh, he pretend to know the past, the present, and the future. Let, let us uh, test him. And what happened? Cain lost some, uh, some implement in his tent, and he decided to test the whole man and says, OK, let me uh, make me appear what I lost. Eh? If you are a shaman, if you are a sorcerer, you should be able to do that. And he got this very nice answer, in my opinion. A, he says his power was of no avail wherever the pale faces were concerned. <laughs> very good. And not with, with with, uh, and notwithstanding my offer of a very liberal remuneration, I could not prevail upon him to put his incantation into practice. Huh? Then, of course, you have there all the prejudices about the, um, uh, the status of a shaman. Of, uh, I'd say, uh, what he was probably, it was what we uh, call a, a member of one of these medicine society. Uh, that you have in many, many uh, group at the time. Uh, it, is an, it is a society where people were uh, trying to heal other people by what we would call today spiritual means. Uh, and indeed, when you compare the, uh, the medicine of the days, maybe these means were much more efficient than, than the drugs and the, uh, the remedy that, uh, that were given to the, the people at the time. Anyway, so this was probably his real status, and he was famous for that, and that's why he had this reputation. But, but the way, uh, uh, let's see, Cain interpret that, you see that, in fact, he is thinking of his own culture in which sorcerer will, will, or magician will do things like that, will make things appear and disappear and with tricks, and things like that. Huh? He, uh, he also went, uh, finally, uh, the, in this first trip, he went up to Sault Ste. Marie, and uh, then again, I put the two together that you, you see uh, that the, the drawings is a kind of source of, uh, of the finished painting. In Sault Ste. Marie, there's one important thing that happened. It is uh, 
there that he met a man called Balandine, he called him Ballantyne, but uh, apparently it was not his real name, who was working for the Hudson Bay Company. And this man convinced Cain not to go on above Sault Ste. Marie and to toward the west alone without any protection. He says, this is really too dangerous. You will, not, you will die the, on the way. The way to make the trip, this man says, it is to go with the people of the Hudson Bay Company, with the voyageurs. Try to get in there, and with them, you will be able to go as far as you want, and you will be able to see uh, all the Indians. This is interesting because it's exactly the same way that Kathleen succeeded to do what he did. I, uh, these people didn't go like this alone in the, in the forest, like they make us more or less to believe. They were accompanied big fur company. Uh, in, in Canada, of course, it was the Hudson Bay Company. In the, uh, the state, it was others. It was Chuto or people like that. There was other company in, in the state. But in Canada, the Hudson Bay was the thing. And then also, the, the man to contact and the man to have the permission of was uh, the Sir Sam, uh, Thompson. Uh, Sir Thompson was the, the king uh, of, of Canada, I would say at the time, from Sault Ste. Marie to Vancouver. Uh, all this region was belonging to uh, Hudson Bay also including Oregon Territory. Uh, we, we, uh, we always forget that for a while, all this part of, United, of today United States was part of Canada also. Uh, so what Ballantyne told him in Sault Ste. Marie was, be careful if you want to continue, if you want to, and he, indeed he will do that for his second trip. If you want to go west, go with, with a company, get uh, the permission of Simpson, and everything will go well. And it's exactly what Kane did, and for his second trip. The other thing that was interesting here is that what attracted the Indian there in Sault Ste. Marie was the abundance of fish. Uh, they have, it was a fantastic place to fish. So that's why they came there and uh, made, I would say, a temporary uh, installation like you see here. And uh, indeed, the, the type of houses that you see here that uh, um, uh, Cain tried to, to imitate, let's say. We know how it was. Here is a photo of one of uh, the Chippewa Indians that live near the, the Great Lakes there and uh, use uh, birch bark and make this kind of dome-shaped uh, houses and not the teepee like, like in the plain, let's say. Uh. But uh, here, uh, in a way, uh, he makes a boat system, you see, as if, or even a third one here, as if uh, uh, not knowing what to decide exactly. Huh? So this is, this is the, uh, the first trip of, uh, of Kathleen. Uh, and then, let's say, uh, before coming back to Toronto, he go to Makina Island. So this is more closer to the Michigan Lake. Huh? And there there will be uh, an encounter that uh, I think uh, should make, oops, oh. <laughs> Je vais le, lui demander de venir un peu plus tard. <laughs> Wait a minute. Okay, you will see. It's a, only in my devious head these two things could have suddenly <laughs> appeared together. But I will try to make sense of that. Wait a minute. Okay, first he met this chief here, who is called Manito Wabe. Uh, Manitou, uh, Manitou, as you know, means spirit or something like that. And Wabe means he. He has spirit. He has devil also, eventually. And. Um, this man is depicted here with, uh, with these uh, half moon shape things on his chest. And these are typical of uh, what we call th this kind of silver smith was used for barting. Uh, to, in exchange of fur, the merchant, the uh, white merchant, were giving them this little piece of silver like this. He had four of them in his neck. He have even here around his uh, knees and all that. So, so in a way, it's, it's a sign of richness. Uh, this was kind of an important chief. He have, of course, his tomahawk also. And, but he's dressed with uh, what you could uh, call almost European clothes, uh, except maybe the moccasin, who are more genuinely Indian. The rest seems to be things that he could have bought uh, in market everywhere. What is interesting here, it is the circumstance as Cain put them, how he painted this guy. He says, I took the likeness of a cheap name, Manitowabe, or he devil. He anxiously inquired what I wanted the likeness for. Uh, the chief asked him, why do you want to make my picture? 
Uh, in order to induce him to sit, well, you were standing, but anyway, to sit is. Uh, I told him that they, they, meaning the picture, were going home to his great mother, the queen. He said that he had often heard of her and was very desirous of seeing her, and that had he the time and means, he would pay her a visit. It pleased him much that his second self would have an opportunity of seeing her. Uh, do you understand what is behind this? The idea it is that these people don't make much difference between that image and themselves. Huh? And in a way, he will say, uh, OK, I cannot see the queen myself, but I'm pleased that my image, my second self, will go there. Yeah. This is a, a, a belief that is attributed to native people, but all over the world since many, many years. Uh, and you will see it's repeated all the time, this thing. And nobody questioned it too much. But in a way, I think it, it's, it's worthwhile to question it a little bit. What is clear in this, it is in comparison with this type of belief, we are fantastic. We make very easily the distinction between a signifier and a signified. Uh, we make very easily the, the, the difference between a real thing and its representation. Uh, we don't have trouble with that. And these people are primitive, and that's why they mix both. Uh, and in a way, it flattered our own uh, perception to think that we can make the distinction and they don't. Uh, you understand this? But is it really true? Are we really make the distinction between both? And this, I want you to think of two, uh, you will see why my Venus will appear at a certain point, two uh, type of image in which we react. Let's say you go to a horror movie and you have an idiot near you who says, I don't worry, it's just a picture. Uh, but, uh, but this is an idiot because you should not be in the, in the room. You should go out. If it's not. But if you are really took by the image, what's happening? The image gives you some clues uh, about what is real there. Somebody very scary and dangerous and, and pounding on you. And uh, so you are scared. You, you believe. You enter in this. And in a way, you don't distinguish well there the representation and the, uh, and the object and what it is. Because in fact, what it is is an actor. Nobody give a damn of his life, uh, how his wife is, did he have kids? No, he's a monster in a movie. You know, it's not the time to think of that. Huh? So you have two processes who are going on there. You have a process of devitalization, uh, the kind you uh, remove life from the picture, uh, from the actual model who's there, his own reality doesn't interest you, and you invest in him something that scares you and, and, uh, and, uh, and make it uh, uh, believable and scary, and so you react like if it, it, it was real. Uh, you see, there's two things. You have a construction of the image in which it's not only an image, it's really something that makes you shout or, or uh, being afraid, and on the other hand, you derealize the, the real person who's there, Monsieur so-and-so that played in a film and who is well paid for it, and, and so remove one, two to be more horrible, and wh whatever. Huh? And, and this, this, you know, the same, <laughs> that's why my Venus was there, the same plays also with, with erotic type of image. Yeah? We also, uh, people say, no, 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 we, we just are interested by the, uh, the, the beauty of, uh, 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 wait a minute, I will put where she is. Uh, left? Yeah. Uh, oh, she disappeared. She doesn't want to be there. Okay. We, uh, no, okay. And then this, I want to, we will keep our whole guy there. The, uh, Dan will say, no, no, this is uh, Tiziano. Uh, we are very interested just by the aesthetic and all this. We, we can make the distinction between what is erotic there and what is a representation. And in fact, it's not true. Why? Why we get moved also, and we couldn't care less of also of the model, uh, to tell the truth. Maybe men understand me better now than women, but anyway, the model of who she is, and uh, well, it, it's not very important. Uh, we make her enter in a kind of sexual scenario uh, who we give her a kind of uh, other 
uh, consistency, let's say, than what she really is. Huh? And uh, the same could be true, well, for another type of artistic image, let's say, who will play on the horror also. Let's say, like this Goya famous picture, it's called the Colossus, and that uh, represent uh, people uh, running away from him. So you could say even in, in canonic art, you will have the, the same type of things. Uh, these two movements, I think, are important to realize. Even whatever the pretext we have, we do uh, uh, these two things. We derealize de the model, and we invest him with certain content uh, for certain interests or desire. So indeed, we are not so different from uh, the Indians who pretendously uh, doesn't make the distinction between image and represent, uh, representation and reality. Yeah? And that, from the point of view of the model, this should create a certain resentment of the perception that you have. It is believable also. If you are a model and you know that people are not really interested in what you are, but just in a scenario of their own, uh, of their own psy psyche, you could have a certain resentment against that. You could feel almost also that you are in danger, and God knows if certain model could be in danger uh, by some maniac, you see, who, 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 who decide to translate his fantasy in reality. Yep. I remember that uh, my childhood, we, we heard that Hector Charlin, okay, who he was, he was the man who was playing the role of Seraphin in uh, Un homme et son péché. Uh, you, uh, you have seen maybe the film today. And uh, we were told that this actor was beaten by a bunch of uh, nice French Canadian because he was so bad to his wife. Uh, so uh, the, 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 the public there, and they were very enraged again, but, but it was an actor. And the poor guy w was beaten coming out from the studio of Radio Canada. Okay, I says it was French Canadian, don't laugh too much. I was told that Anglo Canadian used to want to consult Dr. Will B on television. <laughs> they were sending <laughs> a lot of uh, demands like this. So this is again, it's, it's, a, it's a case in which image and reality are confounded again, huh? and with eventually a certain danger. So we're not so far from what we attribute to the Indian. So what to say of these uh, so-called interpretation of their, say for instance, you have this in the James, uh, uh, the famous uh, George, Fra James George Fraser and the Golden Ball. He have a whole chapter on this, uh, almost half a book on this subject. And he, he explained it. People who hold this belief are naturally unwilling to have their like, likeness taken. The belief that uh, the image is like uh, capture their soul, uh, keep their soul. For if the portrait is the soul, or at least a vital part of the person portrayed, whoever possesses the portrait will be able to exercise a fatal influence on the original. Uh, well, this type of explanation, in fact, just is just there to reinforce our own prejudice about our capacity to, to distingu distinguish both. If you want to, to, to read uh, about this uh, very illuminating text, uh, I would suggest try to put your hand on David Friedberg's book, The Power of the Image. Uh, uh, the powers in, of the image, in fact. Um, you have the chapter 10 is devoted to this type of, of situation, and I think he explained it uh, why, uh, carefully. Uh, I think one of his main points also is to say that a certain type of art history wants not to see these aspects uh, of our response to work of art and pretend to be just on the aesthetic safe side are fooling themselves, are, are in a way uh, not honest about their own feelings about, about the work of art. Huh? So maybe it's a long, <laughs> a long uh, detour because of this poor man who's there. But uh, if you go back to what he says, I think it makes sense. He says, ah, oh, if you bring my picture to the queen, maybe it will help my future encounter with her. She will know me. She will, know, she will have a likeness of me. And maybe that's exactly what he means. But since Cain was uh, committed to the explanation that these are primitive and they don't make the distinction between image and reality, he, he transformed it as he, he speaks of the second self. Huh? But I'm not sure that the, 
this man used this word. Uh, again, you, you are dealing to very interpreted type of things. Okay, I will not uh, uh, go as far with the other picture. Uh, just, we va attend un peu, on va laisser là. The, uh, for instance, another personage that he have, uh, that he have painted at that place is this, this lady here, uh, it's called North Wind, it's a beautiful name, and uh, she was also uh, uh, depicted uh, at this time uh, with also a lot of these uh, uh, silver uh, used to barter. See, all these circles that he have, that she has here, uh, are indeed uh, this famous type of uh, silver uh, that were exchanged uh, with, with the Indians by, by the white merchant at the time. Uh, so it's, it's a good case also of that. We don't know how she reacted to the situation because Kane uh, doesn't mention it, but uh, we could imagine that she could have also a certain question about what you will do with this picture say, <coughs> of mine, say, wh wh what, you will, what you will do. Uh, the trip finally, the, the first trip finished with uh, a scene that I've, uh, unfortunately I don't have it in color, but uh, a scene that m must have excited Kane also. It's a sparing, is, he called it sparing salmon by torchlight in Fox River. Well, I don't think there's salmon in the Great Lakes. You see, uh, they, are, they jump falls, but the Niagara Fall is a little bit tough, <laughs> see? And uh, it's a little bit high. But anyway, whatever he meant, uh, fishing uh, by night with, with, uh, with light like this. And he says that it reminds uh, a scene of his boy, uh, boyhood. In my boyish days, I have seen as many as a hundred <laughs> light jack gliding about the Bay of Toronto, and I'd often joined in the sport. This, I suppose, gave me additional interest in the scene. Right, possible, okay. The other trip that he made, okay, I said there was two big trip of Kane in, in Canada to, to depict uh, the Indian. The other one, I, I will not give it in details because it will be too long, I will insist only on two episodes. One, the first one, it is um, an encounter, let's say, that he made with the Métis people around Winnipeg. Uh, so I, I, you remember I explained before that uh, from the, the second trip he will really uh, go with the people of the Hudson Bay Company. He will be always with people, always with interpreter eventually. But anyway, when he got to Winnipeg, he uh, decided to uh, accompany the Métis in the buffalo hunt. Again, this is, of course, very typical as a choice because then even if they are Métis and they are, in fact, half white, half, half Indian, and they live in, uh, near Fort Garry at the time, so this is a kind of early depiction of, of uh, Saint Boniface and uh, the future Winnipeg, if you want. You have here on the side of the Red River uh, the Archbishop, uh, Archbishop Ray, you have the cathedral, and already uh, what will be, and the hospital, what will be Saint Boniface uh, of, of today. And on the other side, what you see, it's for Gary, with a kind of uh, windmill, uh, very s uh, small uh, uh, installation where Winnipeg will develop after. Uh, when you go to Winnipeg, you still have a reconstruction of for Gary that you could see. And uh, this is done in the style of the, uh, of the English uh, watercolorists of the time, like Paul Sandby and people like that. So it's, uh, you, you gave a lot of atmosphere, a lot of uh, place to, to sky effect, and very detailed foreground, and the rest more in, in, uh, in shadow, in the fog, if you want, more difficult to see. And, and there he learned, of course, of this buffalo hunt and decided to accompany the uh, the Métis people uh, with them and make as, as many sketches as possible of that. So you see them now going toward the buffalo. He explained that, of course, you have to be careful not to have the wind uh, in your direction because they will smell you and they, and they will just disappear. And anyway, he gave all the details necessary uh, for the division. And, and there is, uh, see, there's many sketches also that he did of that. Uh, of people now really attacking uh, these buffalo who are running away. Uh, they could kill 500 of them in one day. Uh, uh, this is a lot of uh, a slaughter I'd say that uh, we have no idea, and that's why there's so, many, so few left today. Uh, they were, you may have seen the film of um, the Dance Wolf, how uh, s'appelait? Well, dance with the wolf, uh, in which you have an excellent depiction of this type of hunting. But at the time of Cain, they were doing it with guns, uh, not with arrow and, and, and bow, bow and arrow. 
And uh, one of the problem, apparently, it was sometimes they killed each other. Huh? They, they missed the, the gun were not so accurate. They were on horses at full speed. And they, they were warned, be careful not, not to kill you, your neighbor. Anyway, he, did, he described it. And uh, he sent to uh, Monsieur Thompson that I mentioned before, uh, probably a painting much more elaborated like this one, of course, was done in studio. Huh? You cannot do a thing like that on the spot, in which uh, the Métis people are supposed to run after buffaloes and, and be very at close range and, and succeeded to the. And he got th this commentary of, uh, of Thompson that I'm, uh, I'm reading to you, and you will see uh, what effect it have on him. In taking the sketch of the buffalo hunt, you were good enough to send me last year. You must have stood in the reel of the herd. A side view will have given a better idea of the appearance of the animal. As from a hind view, it requires a little explanation to make a stranger understand that the mass of dark object before him were intended either for buffalo or any other living animals. This is not a very nice criticism, of course. And I think this is what explained that you get uh, uh, I, I will not say thousands, but many, many depictions of buffalo on side view in Cain. So this is one, this is another one, and <laughs> I could go on like this. There's many. I think he took very seriously this critique of Simpson and decided not to proceed that way. Uh, okay. Then the other part of the second trip I wanted to, to underline, it is the, the part who deal with the with the West. Uh, finally, he went through Oregon country up to a place called Fort Vancouver, not to be confounded with the city of Vancouver, because really this is Oregon. And he depicted there some chief and things. And then he went up to uh, Vancouver Island and to Victoria region and painted there also some of the uh, uh, of people of, of, of the coast there, the Nootka uh, people and the, a little bit of Kwakiutl, you will see. And, uh, and then come back by the same way, by the same route up to Toronto and work for the rest of his life on this, uh, on the material that he, he have uh, gathered uh, during this trip. Uh, the, uh, uh, for instance, I wanted to, uh, well, to show you, okay, this is to evoke a little bit the west part of, of the country with Mount Hood there in the back and a lodge here in the front. I think I had the, maybe, oh wait, this is the chief, okay. And, uh, where is he? Oop. Attendez, il y a peut-être plus loin? No. What? Okay, we'll put them like this. The, uh, this chief that is represented there, this is also interesting because, again, you have a case in which the chief resisted to, okay, he was a Cree. Uh, and he was trying to gather uh, other tribes with him to fight against the Blackfoot, the Blackfeet. Huh? And, uh, and the process was he was going to one tribe to the other and then gathering a special pipe as a, a way to establish, uh, let's say, a, a kind of contract huh, with the other tribe. And uh, Cain wanted very much not only to to have one of these pipes, but also eventually even to, to, uh, uh, to depict them, but also even to buy some of them. See? Because these guys are also collectors. They bring back costume and artifacts in order to be able to reconstruct the scene in the studio. Uh, this is always a part of the deal. And here you will see again, you have a kind of uh, hesitation from this chief to go uh, all the way. He says, uh, to give him all this permission, ki hakika. Sakowe, this is his, his uh, name, according to Kane, is the head chief of all the Crees and was now traveling through all their camps to induce them to take up the Tomahawk and follow him on a war excursion in the following spring. He had 11 medicine pipe stems uh, with him, 10 of which belonged to inferior chiefs who had already consented to join him in the expedition. On the day following, I endeavored to prevail on him to open the pipe stems in order that I might sketch some of them. This he at first declined. Always the, the kind of suspicion of what they will do with the image. Uh, until he had been told that I was a great medicine man and that my sketching them could very much increase 
their efficiency when open on the field of battle. Well, this is Cain <laughs> becoming himself a shaman, you know, and pretending that because he will depict the, the pipe, they will have even more power on the battlefield. Huh? And this is exactly the Pygmalion type of, uh, I would say, uh, symptom. Huh? You know what's a Pyg Pygmalion story? It is a sculptor who made such a beautiful sculpture that it should become alive, finally. Huh? And, and this, is, this is also, it's not in the tradition of the Indian. This is in our tradition that we have this myth of a, a so perfect uh, depiction of the others that it could come almost alive. Huh? And, and then you see it's a way also to congratulate the painter himself. He said all these stories also in a way to say how realistic I am, how uh, powerful my painting is. Uh, and Kathleen uh, make the same type of remarks also all the time. That the people admire his skill and call him a great medicine man or a great shaman himself. Uh, uh, this is uh, very, very typical also of that uh, type of approach. The other picture on the left is um, more strange in a way. It is uh, what he call a flathead woman. Uh, and uh, you see she has a very uh, strong angle, let's see, uh, of it. And she is with her baby and uh, in the process of flattening his skull also. Uh, uh, well, he explained that uh, the baby doesn't suffer, that it's from uh, uh, when he's born to about uh, 10 months or 12 months that he do that, that they cry when they remove <laughs> the little, the little uh, uh, cradle and uh, that doesn't affect them at all. But it is a fact that this type of picture was immensely popular. Huh? People love these type of things because it shows so much difference between us and, 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 and them, and because it shows, I would say, physical difference. Uh, this is what attracts them. There's two themes that you will see who are always repeated. It is this theme of the flathead uh, woman, and also of the usage of the elaborate. The elaborate is a kind of things that they put in their uh, lower uh, uh, lips and extend the lips like this. Huh? This will be uh, more typical of the women of the north of the coast, of, of the west coast, and this more typical of the south. Uh, and, and Cain will do both also. He will, he will, uh, and this was goods, uh, easy to sell. Huh? Uh, I, I don't remember if I put in parallel. Ah, yeah, this is the same chief. La. I put it in the wrong place, I think. That way. Okay, this is a, you see a sketch uh, of, of this woman, and uh, then you have another painting of it. And the fact that we have, let's say, a sketch and two paintings, and probably we have one here in the Museum of Fine Arts here in Montreal. We have one in Toronto also at the ROM. Uh, the fact that so many copies of that is typical of the demand of uh, how, how popular this type of picture was. I think what is behind it is, the, I was uh, stressing at the beginning, to the, the racial uh, type of analysis that they were doing. This is typical of that. The, different, the physical difference is stress and uh, it, it's more exotic, if you want, and, and there, there is uh, uh, then a good feeling of difference, you know, we're better, we don't have our flat head like this, and they are ridiculous doing this, as if we had uh, all our usage were perfectly normal also. Uh, it's always the same type of, uh, of opposition between both. Uh, for instance, he, he made even a sketch of the baby as if it was, uh, and he explained it at length in, the, in, the, uh, in his book. Huh? The process is as follows. The Indian mothers all carry their infants strapped on a piece of board covered with moss and loose fibers of cedar bark. And in order to flatten the head, they place a pad on the infant's forehead, on top of which is laid a piece of smooth bark bound by leathern band passing through holes in the board on either side and kept tightly pressed across the front of the head, a sort of pillow of grass of cedar fibers being placed under the back of the neck to support it. Uh, a very precise description as if people really want to have details on that. Finally, uh, the, the last uh, paintings, let's say, that uh, he did are more fantastic uh, reconstruction, let's see, in, in this case, of a battle, of course, that he never uh, witnessed and that he heard about, and he tried to, to reconstruct uh, what happened there. It's called a battle at Ienus. Alors, Ienus is on the Vancouver Island already. Uh, this is uh, the end of his trip in, toward the north. And uh, then again, if you 
put in parallel some of the sketches, you will see how he has proceeded. This is a sketch of probably closer to what he saw. Yeah? And of course, all the personages that is ha are added there, the canoe coming to uh, attack this palisade village, the fire, of course, that's suggested here, all this have been, uh, it's like uh, improved uh, in a way. The foreground here that you see, a kind of statue here and, and big, uh, uh, cases are done probably from that sketch. Huh? You see the, the same type of sculpture, and he added that because uh, it makes some uh, uh, more dramatic uh, aspect. And of course, if you notice it, it's one of the rare examples that I've showed you, I think it's the first one, of a sculpture of the art of the native people. Uh, it's a thing that is not represented. And here he's dealing with people who are very great artists. Huh? He's dealing with the people of the West Coast, uh, the people who, build, who make totems and make masks and, and things like that, a wonderful art. And this is not perceived much. Huh? You will see there is one example in which it is, but, but one example. Huh? And here you have, for instance, also in the, uh, uh, oh, it's hard to see here. There's a big door there where he used a, a kind of these crude drawings who have nothing much to do with totem pole like we know today, but uh, probably that's the way he perceived them. Huh? The other example where indeed you have a representation of mask like here, it is in this, uh, in this picture, uh, which is supposed to represent a, he call it medicine mask dance, and he, Again, this is a kind of reconstruction because we know in his sketch pad we have one representation and if you notice, you will see some of the mask and even these two are here. Huh? And uh, some of them are, are really taken as such. So what he saw probably, it was a collection of these masks huh, because they were already collected both by first the Russian uh, people who came from Alaska and from the north and that's why uh, in Leningrad, for, uh, well, St. Petersburg, now you have a wonderful collection of very ancient uh, art of the Tinglet people and of uh, the, uh, the Haida people. And also, of course, the Canadian and the American were collecting these things. So he probably saw that. And he completed it with bodies. Huh? He just added uh, bodies like that. And he put them outside which is, again, it's an error because these dance habitually are done inside of big houses. They are not done naked and outside like this. Huh? But to make it more, more wild in a way, this is perfect. You put them naked. You, you give a, a chill cut uh, a blanket to one of them uh, and, and, and you uh, uh, organize your mask in such a way that uh, it looks real, you see. Uh, this is, a, again, a very good example of reconstruction. And one of the rare examples where art is the main subject. Huh? And uh, this it doesn't mean that he perceive it as art, uh, because uh, what uh, they call these type of mask at the time was curios, huh? was things that you just bring as a kind of strange uh, manifestation of, of, the, of the culture of the others. And, uh, and uh, that was not necessarily perceived as art. Huh? But the fact that there's so little is interesting. Later, I want to make a lecture on Emily Carr, and you will see you have a completely opposite point of view there. For Emily Carr, in the contrary, the Indian heart is the main source of inspiration. Huh? And uh, she will uh, bring, a, a, I would say, almost a Copernican revolution in the, in the approach uh, of the subject. And uh, I have finally a uh, last example in which you see the mask of this man is used now for another picture, see? Really to, to demonstrate that what he, what he, he did, it's a, s a series of sketch, and then from there he could build images uh, of different kind. Uh, all the, all the, with, with this lecture, if you notice, so I, what I tried to do, it was to show how these images are constructed, are, are not uh, just uh, uh, depicted. And uh, it is, of course, in the construction of the picture that certain of the preconception of Cain could, uh, uh, could uh, I would say, uh, get in the picture. Uh, and also, eventually, the preconception of the onlooker, too. Uh, this picture had a response, and I insisted on that, that we are, in a way, uh, derealizing uh, the subject matter and invest it with our own preoccupation, our own uh, picture. Uh, Friedberg suggests that uh, a kind of formalist approach to art 
uh, doesn't want to see this reality. Uh, I agree that <laughs> with him that we project more in, in picture that we pretend to do. Huh? But on the other hand, I think it's important also this uh, kind of uh, frustration of the image uh, that, uh, let's say, abstract art or, or more contemporary art creates. Because in a way, it put in question this idea that we could, like this, derealize uh, the, the model, the reality, and invest it with any content we want. Huh? With an abstract painting, of course, you cannot do that. What you see is what you get. Huh? You have uh, uh, just what is in front of you. Okay, it have, I think, a role and kind of a critic role of what realism is all about. Uh, that realism is not so innocent that we think. We, we, we take it for granted, but in fact, as I tried to show you, maybe uh, Grass, uh, Monsieur uh, uh, Manitou uh, Howe, <laughs> that I was showing before, that uh, indeed uh, realism is not so innocent. And that the reaction that he had, and like many others also, uh, toward this type of art is not completely uh, false and is not completely uh, laughable. In the contrary, uh, I think there is a seriousness in that, that they felt, and they could express it uh, the way they could. But uh, for us, I, I guess it's a lesson also to, to see the limit of this type of art. OK, so thank you. Not too bad. <laughs>